our speaker tonight is not uh, uh, a member of the family that I was as acquainted with as his mother and dad and then uh, his sister has served with my wife and also been close to her in many uh, in many ways and so we have had a connection there uh, brother Bernard is uh, an astounding and outstanding man he has many many great qualities that could propel him in the world in the social world in the world of the academia he could uh, be and is anything that he wants to be and uh, he has degrees and he is chancellor of the university and he is uh, qualified in so many different ways i've never heard him but what it was not just a sermon but it was a powerful message powerful message he is a preacher extraordinary it is just amazing. And of all of the allocates that we could give him and that I personally could give him and all of them would be true, in my estimation, the fact that he is a child of God, surrendered to and committed to the calling of the ministry is the greatest calling of all things. And so tonight, I'd like you to stand and give a good, warm welcome to our General Superintendent, Brother Bernard. Thank you for coming. Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Can we praise the Lord together? Can we glorify the Lord, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords? Praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm not going to start with the text. I'll get there sooner or later. Uh, but I want to share some things with you tonight. And first of all, let me say it's great to be back on the east side of the river. And I come here periodically, preached here quite a bit. In fact, I've preached in this church before. And December 31st, 1984, watch night service. Most of you probably weren't here, but Brother Hall was the editor-in-chief, and that was actually before I moved to St. Louis, but I would come up and work for him a little bit. And he liked to come to this church, um, and he liked to talk to Brother Reeves about doctrine. And so one of those times, Brother Reeves asked me to come over and preach, so that's what I did. And so it's been a while, but I'm back. Uh, And uh, we appreciate the work your pastor is doing. I've kind of been uh, kind of keeping up with the church from afar over the last number of years, and it's good to see a great revival taking place. Amen. Amen. Numerically, spiritually, in every way. And so thank God for that. And I also want to mention, some of you may know, but uh, I just want to take a few minutes God is blessing the United Pentecostal Church International in a great way. You are part of that church. You see some things that are happening. You see what's happening in perhaps the St. Louis area. You may hear some reports, uh, but uh, I have the privilege of seeing it from a bigger perspective. And we're now in 221 nations and territories around the world. Praise God. Over 40,000 congregations. Here in the United States and Canada, over 4,600 churches. Over 10,000 licensed and ordained ministers. That's a first. That's a record. In fact, we have more churches, more constituents, more ministers. That's true here in the U.S. That's true worldwide. We're stronger in finances. We have just bought a new headquarters building. Perhaps you heard about that over in Weldon Springs. So I've been moving. My wife and I moved our physical location of our, we were staying in the house, living in the headquarters house, but since the whole thing is being sold, we had to get our own place, so we bought a little condominium, and so we've been moving there last week, and this week we're still unpacking, um, and then Friday I began working at our new office, and um, so I'm unpacking there. If you visit me, the whole office is all my books are in boxes until we can either buy or build some bookcases. The previous administrator, I don't think, had any books. So, uh, and I've got, 
I've got uh, four offices in four different locations, and I've got books in every one of them. So they're scattered all over, uh, but I need at least some place for a few hundred books here and there. So uh, we've been in a big process of moving, but it's exciting to see what God is doing. Um, and, of course, it's not limited to the United Pentecostal Church International, but it includes that. And our mission is the whole gospel to the whole world by the whole church. And you are part of that. So thank you for being part of what I just described. We appreciate your pastor. We appreciate you because it's, it's pastors like yours and churches like yours binding together that enable us to accomplish what we're accomplishing. And I've mentioned it several places, but, uh, you know, we, as, as Pentecostals, we call ourselves Pentecostal because we believe the original experience of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost is not just a one-time event, it's not just a historical event, but it's for the church today. Everyone should have that same experience. Amen. We call ourselves apostolic because we believe that what the apostles preached and what they practiced that's recorded in the New Testament is the norm. It's not the exception, but it's the norm. It's the expectation. It's the pattern for the church today. So when we read the New Testament, we desire to see those same things take place in our church and our lives. We seek to follow those same teachings. When we read the wonderful accounts of miracles in the New Testament, we expect the miraculous today. We read the book of Acts and we marvel over the thousands that were converted and the many notable healings. But if you think the book of Acts was written uh, covering about a 30-year time span, if we would take the history of the United Pentecostal Church over the last 30 years, we could find similar accounts. In fact, if we would just take 30 days we could find similar accounts. I've mentioned uh, it several times, but in February of this year, in the country of Bangladesh, when we had our national conference, 3,500 people received the Holy Ghost. That's a little bit more than the original day of Pentecost. In the same month, in our national conference in Thailand, a, a lame man was healed and rose up and began jumping and dancing. That's what happened in Acts chapter 3. In the same month of February in the Philippines, our national conference, 35,000 people attended, 5,000 received the Holy Ghost. Praise God. That's what happened in Acts 4, where 5,000 were added to the church. So we can just go right down the line. Now, Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira were killed for lying to the Lord. So we don't necessarily have to see that duplicated. If you'll just be honest, tell the truth, don't lie to the pastor, stay out of trouble, then we'll try to skip over that particular apostolic precedent. But if you read how the Apostle Paul was brought before kings and governors, although in prison, yet he was able to share the gospel. Well, in February uh, of this year, or March maybe it was, um, one of our church members in the country of Myanmar was elected as the vice president of the country. In June, I went to New York City where we have a Bible study at the United Nations headquarters, downtown Manhattan. Uh, one of our ministers, Brother Art Wilson, he's African American. His wife is ethnic Korean, so they kind of represent the UN right there. He has been officially appointed as ambassador to the UN, a religious chaplain having an office in the United Nations headquarters. I think that's unprecedented for any religious organization. But we have a Bible study on the 27th floor every week, and we have a chapel service in the chapel across the street, and we baptize people in the UN swimming pool. We've seen about 40 people. These are staff members and delegates in the last couple of years baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. When my wife and I went there in June, I taught the Bible study at the end. One of the delegates received the Holy Ghost right there in the room. So we are seeing the book of Acts repeated in our day. 
And it's not because we're great, it's because God is great. We're no better than anybody else. Our church is no better than any other church, humanly speaking. But we do believe in the grace of God. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Everything we accomplish is not by our extraordinary ability, but it's God's grace. Now, let me give you a simple definition of grace. Grace is God's gift to us. Now, when it's a gift, that means you don't earn it. You don't pay for it. You don't deserve it. The only way to receive a gift is to open your hands. The only way to receive a gift is to take it and unwrap it. In other words, you must have faith. That's simply what it takes, nothing more, nothing less. But I would also like to add to that definition, not only is grace God's gift to us, but grace is also God's work in us. Because grace is not passive, it's active. Some people just look at salvation as well. You just believe mentally and acknowledge a set of doctrines, and that's what salvation is. But they're missing the point that grace actually gives you something. It's called the new birth experience. And grace changes you. It transforms you from the inside out where you become a different person. So grace is God working in you. Some people look at grace as simply, well, God forgives me so I can just keep on sinning because every day he forgives me. Well, that's an in inadequate concept of grace. Yes, do God does forgive, but His purpose is much greater than that. He does not want to leave you in your sins. He do not, does not want to leave you as a practicing sinner. He wants to see you changed and molded into His image. We can't do that by our ability, but that's what grace is all about because what we cannot do, God can do. And so that's why we find, for example, in Titus 2.11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So grace teaches us. Grace changes us. Grace molds us. Grace is God's work in us. Now, let me just share a little bit from the scriptural perspective. And to do so, I first of all want to look at the very end of the Old Testament. The Old Testament represents God's covenant with the nation of Israel. It was not the final covenant, but it was meant to pave the way for God's full plan of salvation. So God chose a nation and called them out to be different from all other nations and to exalt the name of God, the name Jehovah or Yahweh. And through this nation, he would bring the scriptures. And through this nation, he would bring the Messiah. And through the Messiah would be the plan of salvation. Through the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, salvation could come to the whole world. And so in the Old Testament, we read God's first covenant, the Old Covenant. And I'd like to read from the very end of that covenant, the book of Malachi. It's the very last two verses of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. And I want you to notice, this is kind of the summary of the Old Testament. This is kind of the, the last word, putting it all together. This is what God says in Malachi 4, 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And then that's the end. And there are approximately 400 silent years with no prophet speaking for God until John the Baptist comes on the scene in the beginning of the New Testament preparing the way for Jesus Christ. Now I want you to notice there are two important points. The first thing, there is a promise. He says, I'm going to send a prophet who will prepare the way. And this prophet will have a ministry of reconciliation. He will restore the fathers to the children. I think that stands for reconciliation in the family because the father is the leader of the family. And if the family is reconciled, then society can be reconciled. The church can be productive. So really, this is the beginning of a great work of reconciliation and restoration. So notice the Old Testament ends with a hopeful note 
note that I'm not finished yet. I'm still working. My grace is still going forth. And no matter how bad things may seem, there is a future restoration. There is a future reconciliation. So that's my first point. There is a promise of grace. But that's not the end. There's a second thing, a warning. Unless I strike the earth or smite the earth with a curse. In other words, if you reject God's message, you're left with a curse. So not only is there a promise, but there's also a warning. If we reject grace, what we have left is called judgment. Now, preachers today don't like to talk about judgment or hell or the lake of fire because, you know, that's kind of disturbing. But if we're going to preach grace, we have to be honest and say, what happens if you reject grace? We have to consider that. Now, I don't believe God sends anybody to hell. If someone goes to hell, it's because they have made a choice of a direction to go. Let me explain it this way. When God created Adam and Eve in the beginning, He created them to have fellowship with Him. He gave them a life, physical life and spiritual life. When they sinned, they broke the fellowship with God. When we sin, we break fellowship. Now think about it. If God is the source of life and we break fellowship with life, what do we have left? Death. So it's like the electricity in this building. You unplug, you have nothing. The building may be full of power, but if you turn off the switch or you unplug the plug, you're lifeless. You have no power. Now, God is the source of all love, all joy, all peace. I believe that even unbelievers today, whatever love they experience, whatever joy they experience, it's by the grace of God. Even an atheist is enjoying the blessings of God in this life. But in the life to come, when we reject God for the first time, we would experience no life, no joy, no peace, no love, no grace. That will be death. That will be the lake of fire. That will be eternity without God. You say, well, that's not really happening. It's like a vase full of flowers. You can cut the flowers, put them in a vase in some water, and they will look just as good as they did before. And they will last for a week or two. And they may look to be just great. But it's only a matter of time. They will wither and die. Why? They're cut off from the source of life. That's the same with us. We may live for 70 or 80 or however many years. And unbelievers, they may seem to be wealthy, successful, have a good life, all kinds of enjoyment. But it's just a matter of time. If they're not connected with the source of life, eventually their only future is death. And so we have to be honest. If we reject God's grace, there's nothing left for us. So there's a promise and a warning. There is grace, but also judgment. Now let me go to the end of the New Testament. The New Testament rec represents God's second covenant. The fullness of God's plan of salvation. The fullness of that experience whereby we're connected back to God. We are living in the New Testament church age. We're living in that age today. So I want to read from the end of the New Testament. Revelation 22. And I will start with verse 17. So this is like the summary. Not just of that book, but... John was the last apostle left alive, and he was conscious of that fact. Revelation is no doubt the last book of the New Testament. And so it's a fitting conclusion. And so here's God's last word, God's word for today. God's word to us. And he says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst, come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. What a wonderful message of grace. The Spirit of God is drawing us here tonight saying, come. 
And the bride, that's the people of God, that's the church, they also say, come. Now, some might say, well, the church is full of judgmental people. They hate sinners. And if you live a certain lifestyle that they don't approve of, then they're bigoted and they hate you. That's totally wrong. Regardless of what you believe or regardless of your religion or lack thereof, regardless of your choice of lifestyle, I want you to know the church welcomes you. We want you to come because here is where you'll, you'll hear the truth. Here is where your sins can be forgiven. Here's where your life can be changed. So we encourage you to come. You don't have to agree with our teachings in order to come to church and worship with us. We welcome you. The Spirit is not rejecting you. The Spirit is drawing you. The bride is not rejecting you. The bride is encouraging you, inviting you to come. And what's the qualification? Let him that heareth. You have to hear. And him that is a thirst, you have to be thirsty. You have to want it. And whosoever will, anyone who desires, notice the only qualification, you have to desire God. You have to seek God. You have to be willing to turn away from your old life, which is called repentance. In other words, it doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter the language that you speak. It doesn't matter if you have lots of money or no money. It doesn't matter if you're highly educated or not so educated. It doesn't matter what kind of sins you've committed in your past. None of that will disqualify you from receiving grace. By definition, grace is not something you deserve. It's something God freely gives. If you want to qualify for God's grace, all you have to say, is I want it I need it I desire it I'm hungry I'm thirsty Jesus said blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled oh let's praise the Lord right now hallelujah 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 what a promise of grace Grace. But let's keep reading. Verse 18 and verse 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add to these things, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, I suppose if you take a physical Bible and you add pages to it, say, I've written, a new, I've written a new book of the Bible. Or if you took that same Bible and tore out some pages, threw them in the trash, and said, I, I'm not going to believe that, then that, that, that warning applies to you. But I'm not so sure that's the only way it applies. What if you add doctrines that are not in the Bible? What if you add traditions of men that are not according to God's Word? What if you add requirements for salvation that God doesn't state? Wouldn't that be the same thing? That's why in this church, we want to simply preach and teach the Word of God. We want to preach simply who Jesus is, the one true God manifested in the flesh. That's why we baptize in Jesus' name, because we do not want to add traditions of men. We do not want to add developments over the centuries of creeds and doctrines and councils and popes. If what they have to say is in the Bible, well and good. But if what they have to say is not in the Bible, then we're under no obligation to follow. In fact, we're forbidden to follow it. Don't add to the Word. Likewise, don't take away from the Word. Somebody says, well, I don't feel a conviction about such and such. Well, if it's Scripture, you don't even need to feel a conviction. You're supposed to obey. Now, you like to say, well, I don't feel convicted about lying. It doesn't matter whether you feel convicted or not. You're not supposed to lie. You're supposed to tell the truth. God's Word is settled. People today say, well, you know, the Bible teaches on sexual morality. 
The Bible teaches on modesty of dress. The Bible teaches gender distinction, male and female. Boy, how, how relevant is that? And we say, well, modern psychology and modern sociology, they have advanced so far beyond the primitive knowledge of the people of Scripture, so we have to modify and update and change the doctrines. No, don't add to and don't take away. Just follow the Word of God. It's not limited to a culture. It's for all human beings. It's the Word of God. So notice there's a warning. Isn't that interesting? Just like the Old Testament ended with a promise and a warning, so the New Testament ends with a promise and a warning. Just like the Old Testament had grace and judgment, so the New Testament proclaims grace, but if you reject it, it proclaims judgment. Well, we're not quite finished. If you read the remaining verses, verse 20 through 22, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Verse 21 is the last one. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, that's the end of the Bible. As I've said, the Old Testament and the New Testament are parallel. But there's one difference. Have you noticed the difference? The Old Testament ends, the very last word is curse. It ends with the warning of judgment. But the New Testament, the very last verse, is a prayer for the grace of God. So even though the messages are the same, there's a shift of emphasis. The words ringing in our ears today are not curse. The words ringing in our ears, the word is grace. Here's my message. I'm finally getting to the main point. Here's my title for those of you that have to have titles. Here it is. Grace has the last word. Grace has the last word. I'm preaching to Granite City and Eastern St. Louis I'm preaching in God's plan. It is not His will for you to be destroyed. It's not His will for you to be lost. It's not His will for you to be discouraged and defeated. In God's plan, grace has the last word. In God's plan, restoration is the last word. Healing is the last word. Deliverance is the last word. God's plan for you is grace. Oh, praise the Lord right now. Grace has the last word. Grace has the last word. Praise God. So in our day, every generation faces it, but it seems our day is facing pressures like never before. Some are discouraged. Some are depressed. Some have contemplated suicide, even in the church. And church families are not immune from tragedy and people backsliding and people failing God. The church is full of broken, wounded, hurting people. But I want to tell you, I don't have to know anybody's story, and I don't really know anybody's story. But in a crowd this size, I know many people are experiencing living out some of the things I'm describing. But I'm come to tell you, the devil says defeat, but God says victory. God's plan for you is grace. He has a plan of victory. He has a plan of healing. He has a plan of deliverance. He has a plan of forgiveness. It's his will for you to experience the grace of God. Grace has the last word. Remember the story of John Mark, young man. He grew up in church. In fact, his mother's home was a meeting place for the, the early apostolic church. When Peter was thrown in jail, the church gathered in, in his mother's home and to pray. So that was the kind of experience he had. He was a relative of Barnabas, the, the noted mentor and associate of the apostle Paul. So when Paul and Barnabas went on their missionary journey, they took John Mark with them. What a wonderful opportunity for a young minister to get training. Wouldn't you like to get trained from Paul and Barnabas? Especially if you were, felt a call to be a missionary. 
I mean, that's amazing. But not too far into it, he got discouraged. We don't know exactly why, but maybe he was homesick. Maybe he was insecure. Maybe he was afraid. Anyway, he quit and went back home. So the next time they were going on a missionary journey, Barnabas said, well, let's, let's go get John Mark. Paul said, oh, no. He failed. He had his chance. He's not worthy uh, to be a missionary because we gave him the chance and he failed. And the dispute was so sharp between Paul and Barnabas, they split up. Paul took Silas. Barnabas took John Mark. You know, it seems like a pretty sad resume if the Apostle Paul says you're unfit for service. I mean, if you go meet the Global Missions Board and you bring the letter and the Apostle Paul says he, he won't work, I don't think you're going to pass. But you know what? If you read the rest of the story, John Mark became a close associate of the Apostle Peter, was spoken of as Peter's son in the gospel. In fact, John Mark wrote the gospel of Mark, which is so vivid and personal that many people say it actually records the personal recollections of the Apostle Peter. That's how close these two were together. Not only that, in Paul's later epistles, such as Colossians, he commends Mark and says, receive him. He's profitable in the ministry. And he called him his son in the gospel. How would you like to be the son of the gospel of the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul? Grace has the last word. So even though you're in the church, you may have failed in the church. You may have blown a ministry opportunity. You may have failed in some basic assignment that God has given you. You may have been a hypocrite. For all of your good intentions, you may have been a failure. But you know what? Failure is not final. Failure is not supposed to be the last word of your story. You can be renewed. You can be restored. You can be profitable in the kingdom of God. You can be a soul winner yet again. You can be a praise leader again. You can be a prayer warrior again. You can be what you've never been before in God. Because in God's plan, grace has the last word. You can do it. You can make it. You can be what God has called you to be. You can rise to the occasion because grace has the last word. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm preaching to somebody tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, look at the Apostle Paul himself. He persecuted Christians. For a living. He attacked the Christians. He arrested them, put them in jail. He was responsible for at least a few being executed. He blasphemed. He cursed Jesus Christ. God had every right to destroy Saul of Tarsus. It would, God had every right, right, if when Paul was then known as Saul, was traveling on the road to Damascus to find Christians there and arrest them. If God would have sent a bolt of lightning from heaven and struck him dead, that would have been exactly what he deserved. Instead, God saw, despite his blasphemy, his hatred, his violence, he had a desire for truth. And so God struck him, but it was with a light that blinded his physical eyes and forced him to start seeing with spiritual eyes. And to Paul's credit, he gave the only proper response. He realized that all of his ideas were shattered, and so he went back to the basics. Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. What a great revelation of the oneness of God. This Jew calling to Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, saying, Lord, I thought I was serving you, but, but something's wrong. Who are you? What are you like? I don't know you. And the Lord said, he didn't say, oh, oh, I forgot. I need to introduce you to a couple other folks up here. No. He accepted the status as one Lord. But he says, what you need to know, Saul, 
You're trying to worship the one God of Israel, but you're failing miserably. And the reason why is the Lord that you're calling upon, I am Jesus, the very one you're fighting against. That's grace. If God would save a Saul of Tarsus, wouldn't he save you? Wouldn't he save your coworker? Wouldn't he save your backslidden family member? Wouldn't, wouldn't he save somebody in town that's standing up against truth? Sure he would. And so Paul said, what do you want me to do? Obedience. He said, well, I want you to find an apostolic preacher named Ananias. He'll tell you what to do. If you read the rest of the story, Ananias preached to him said, you need to be baptized in Jesus' name, and I need to lay hands on you so that you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So in Paul's conversion experience, it started with repentance on the road to Damascus, but it wasn't complete until several days later when he was baptized by having the name of Jesus called over him, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. That same experience is the promise and the command for everyone today. And you know, it's really simple. We make it far more complicated sometimes than it needs to be. But remember the key word faith and the key word repentance. You simply have to recognize I can't do anything to earn my salvation. I've just got to trust God and I've just got to do what God says. And so we come to God, even if we've been a church member for 30 years, we don't come boasting and bragging of our accomplishments saying we deserve this or that. We come humbly saying, Lord, Forgive me of my sins. I've fallen short of your glory. I make no excuse. I don't try to justify it or explain it. There can be no explanation. I've just fallen short. So, Lord, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to take me as I am. Lord, I surrender my life to you. I'm willing to turn away from my sins, but I can't do it without your grace. I'm ready to change. I'm ready to serve you. I'm, I'm going to stop following my selfish will, and I'm going to follow your will. Whatever traditions or philosophies or pleasures that are stopping me from obeying your word, then I am casting them aside so that I am ready to obey you. That's repentance. You know, we shouldn't just start praising God or encouraging someone to praise God if they haven't really repented. they got to repent. But once you sincerely repent, you will begin to feel the burden lift. And a lot of people stop there and think, wow, I feel good. That's great. In various denominations, they've had that experience. They say, wow, I just got saved tonight. But what they need to realize, God wants to finish the work. Like Saul, he didn't say, oh, go back home, Saul of Tarsus. You now know who I am. You confess me as your Lord. That's it. You don't need anything else. He says, no. Now that you've repented, now you know who I am. Now you confess me as Lord. Now you're willing to obey me. You need to go find a Pentecostal preacher and do what he says. He's going to baptize you in Jesus' name. He's going to lay hands on you to receive the Holy Ghost. So when you feel that burden lift, you start raising your hands. You start worshiping vocally. Don't shut your mouth and try to praise God silently. There's a time for silent prayer, but, but re when you receive the Holy Ghost, that's not a time for silent prayer. That's a time to, to start opening up. That's the time to start surrendering. That's the time to get beyond your personality and just start worshiping God. And you begin to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what I feel right now. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for your promise. I praise you. When you surrender in faith, you're just trusting him. All of a sudden, your lips will begin to move, and don't, don't stop them. Don't shut your mouth and clamp, clench your teeth together, but just start speaking, and you'll speak miraculously in a language you never learn as the Spirit fills you. It's called speaking in tongues. That's grace. That's not something the preacher gives you. That's not something you earn. That's something God gives you. When you're baptized in Jesus' name, the water's not washing away your sins. 
The preacher's not washing away your sins. That's a gift of God. That's why we always call the name of Jesus because we're very conscious that Jesus Christ is the one who's doing the work. Without Him, it's a wasted exercise. It's all grace. Remember, grace is God's gift to us and grace is God's work in us. When you repent of your sins, when you're baptized in Jesus' name, when you receive the Holy Ghost, is that something you do for yourself? No, that is something God gives you, and that is something God is working in you. And that's just the beginning. Anything else we need from God, it comes basically the same way. If you need healing, deliverance, strength, encouragement, you don't come boasting. You come humbly surrendering. And you open your heart in faith. And you begin to worship. That's grace. Now one more point. The Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul, if anyone had faith, he did. If anyone could see miracles, he could. And he did throughout his ministry. He mentioned it in numerous books about the power of God was with him. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he went through a severe trial. And he prayed not once but three times for God to deliver him. And God did not for reasons known only to God. But God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Now we believe in healing. We believe in miracles. We believe in the power of God. We should always believe in the power of God for the miraculous. But we recognize everybody's going to die sooner or later of something until the rapture. As long as we're human, we're going to go through trials. We are. We're not exempt from the trials of life. And so even though we believe for the miraculous and we testify the miraculous and we rejoice over the miraculous, face it, we all have to go through experiences in which God doesn't deliver us the way we think. But in that time, He promises if you ever have to go through something, my grace will be sufficient for that occasion. Grace is not only revealed in the miraculous, grace is revealed in the trial. In fact, perhaps the greatest grace is in the trial. When Jesus died on the cross, that had to be the most incomprehensible thing for anyone. In fact, all of his disciples and apostles forsook him except just the handful that were there at the cross. But all were afraid. But God's grace was never stronger than the cross of Calvary because that's how grace was extended to the whole world. So I'm here to tell you that if you don't receive everything that you feel you need at this moment, don't give up. Keep on keeping on because there's grace during the trial, and there's grace at the end of the trial. Remember, grace has the last word. Your trial is not the last word. Your sickness is not the last word. Your defeat is not the last word. Your weakness is not the last word. Let me tell you the last word. Grace has the last word. God's plan for you is grace. God's plan for you is deliverance. God's plan for you is victory. Oh, let's stand together right now. Oh, let's worship the Lord together. The grace of God is in this place today. This grace is for everyone. Hallelujah. The grace of God is for all who will believe. Oh, the presence of the Lord is here right now. Grace has the last word. Grace has the last word. Oh, hallelujah. Would you close your eyes with me and be in a spirit of prayer? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just remember the devil is a liar. Don't trust even your own feelings or emotions, but trust the grace of God. There's a promise and there's a warning. If we reject the promise, we have the judgment. But it's not God's will for you 
to have the judgment. It's God's will for you to receive grace. God has a plan for your victory. He has a plan for your restoration. He has a plan for your salvation. Grace has the last word. And so right now, as we're all in the spirit of prayer, just help me out right now. If there's somebody you need to make a decision, a commitment to serve Jesus Christ, I want you to come to the front. I want you to kneel here or you can stand here. If you're not really living for the Lord, I want you to make that commitment. I want you to do what I described earlier. The Bible calls it repentance. It's available for anyone and everyone who's here. And while I'm pleading just for a moment, if you feel led to go to anyone, if you, maybe you want to pray and you want to invite someone to come with you, why don't you invite them kindly? Would you, come, would you like to pray with me? Would you like to come to the front? Would you do that right now? Listen, I'm, I'm quitting in plenty of time so that we have time to pray. If there's somebody you've never received the gift of the Holy Spirit, that is God's Spirit filling you, where you speak miraculously in another language called speaking in tongues. If you've never had that experience, it's a command for you tonight. Why don't you come and receive it? It's God's plan for you. If you need the Holy Ghost, I'd like for some ministers and prayer leaders those who've been trained in prayer would you come i know some are coming would you come and pray with these who are coming if you need renewal i'm not saying you're backslidden but you know you need renewal you need restoration i want you to come quickly right now if you need a work of restoration a work of renewal a work of reconciliation would you come right now if there's someone you need physical or or emotional healing if there's someone you need strength for the day, I want you to come right now. All across the building, if you have a special need, don't wait till next Sunday. Why don't you respond right now? Why don't you call out to God? Why don't you come to the front as a sign of your commitment and your faith? Come on, let us pray with you. If you don't come, please, would you pray where you are? Pray for these who are up here or pray for one another. Let's take it to heart. Grace has the last word.